Peak Performance Plus presents the Summit Club Podcast, your business roundtable discussion for sales and business leaders with your host, Bill Stats. Hi, and welcome to the Summit Club, your business roundtable. I'm your host, Bill Stats, with our Summit Club team, Rick Feinblad. Hi, Rick. Hey, Bill. John Thane. Hi, JT. Hey, good morning, Bill. And John Nabikas. Hi, John. Hey, hey. Welcome to episode 12, entitled Coaching Part 2. Last coaching session, we discussed the what's and the why's, and today, JT is going to take us through the actions and the how-tos of coaching. Take it away, JT. Hey, after our last podcast, when we looked at why coaching is necessary and how to define you know, the people or identify people that need coaching, today we're going to talk about the actual how-tos, uh, the how-tos and the actions that a coach has to take to be effective. I'm going to go through these real quickly so we can get them all on the table, and then we can circle back and talk about each. First thing you have to do as a coach is clearly identify the objective or the goal of coaching. Second thing you need to do is create a plan. You know, what, are you, what are you going to do to support that objective and reach the objective? You have to implement a, su- a structure, you know, actions that need to be taken. Here's the really important parts. You have to follow up and analyze where you're at in that plan and structure. And finally, you have to refine and reset at some point. How are you performing against the, uh, the, the goal? And do you need to reset or reevaluate where it's going and how you get there? So with that said, let's go back to point number one and let's talk about identifying the objective and the goal. So uh, the first thing, and it's really important to do this, is to make sure that the person being mentored really understands and agrees with the objectives. And if for some reason they do not, you really need to work that out because if there is an agreement on objectives, uh, you're not getting anywhere. So that's very important and I think it's an appropriate place to start. Well, and you know, when I think about what you guys are talking about, it's like the first action for problem solving is to identify the problem. So I think in a coaching uh, effort, you really need to take a look at well, what have you done so far to improve? I mean, uh, what's happened uh, in the past that might create a place to step off from? You know, one thing about the objectives, the objective doesn't always have to be a problem. It can be literally raising the bar or, or raising some new skill sets that, that might enhance the candidate. So I think we should we should look away from just solving problems and look at it also as, as a situation where we can create opportunity or enhance opportunities for the candidate. You know what's really interesting when you bring that up? You know, Rick and I are working on doing a book review for the Ideal Team Player, and one of the things that, that we're uh, discovering in that book is almost everything you do as a manager or a leader uh, can provide some insight into various, we'll, we'll call them competencies or orientations of, of the folks you're leading or managing. So when you say that, it, it raises the idea that is, is that target aspirational? Because if it's not solving a problem, it might be getting somewhere that they're not and it's a better place. And just hearing that from the protege would give you a really good indication of how they're oriented and what they really want to accomplish. Are they aspirational? Are they trying to improve, not just fixing something that's broken, but to embrace something that could really take them far and away ahead of just fixing the problem? So if if you have a a colleague, employee, what have you, and you're going to set them up with coaching. And it's not that there's a problem, but it's because you want them to be better. How do you set the stage with that person? Hey, I'm going to get you a coach to take care of whatever, and have them not think it's because they suck at something. That's a good, really good question. <laughs> I mean, I just think, you know, you, you look, I mean, a part of all this, uh, you know, part of just, I think, working with somebody in general is, you have to establish a relationship of trust uh, and, and honesty. 
that you know what I'm going to tell you is the truth, and sometimes you may like it, and sometimes you may not like it. But it, but it's all for you. It's all to make you better at what you do. So if you can do that, and you explain to the person, listen, you know, we all have our shortcomings. We all can do things better. But you know, you have a, you know a lot of capabilities, and, and can do, go very very far. And this is designed to get you there. Um, I think if you can frame it like that, and and you know, get some positive reaction from the person you're speaking to, that's the best way to do it. So but it's just I, all how you say it. I think it's all how you say it. And, and by the way, in, in, my, in my experience, you know, I think I've said it appropriately and sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> Somebody's just going through the motions just to make you happy and sooner or later this stuff, you know, just comes out in the wash, so to speak. You know, you know it's interesting they, when you bring that up because I had talked about it before, the windshield versus the rear view mirror and the kind of honest conversation that you're talking about with somebody to John get a focus on getting better, not just fixing a problem is, you know, around here, we're looking through the windshield and everybody wants more from less, including this company. What does that mean to you? It means there are plenty of opportunities if you just work on your game. And then it's more of a forward thinking thing than it is looking in the rear view mirror and the things that didn't work right and things that we have to patch or find workarounds. I, I think it's a really good point. Yeah. And I think people's mo most people's starting point, because just human nature, if you start talking to them about coaching, they believe, okay, I'm doing something wrong, wrong. and uh, you know he's going to try to help me fix it, maybe, or I just have to go through the motions because that's what they want me to do. So to get them to a place where you you know they they understand why it's really there, you really have to have a decent relationship with the people, right. and they have to trust that you're doing this in their best interest. Well, you know, and again, I think this points out to really two different focuses on coaching. One is a problem-solving situation and the other is aspirational. You know, we, we can't always assume that the coaching is coming down, the, you know, from the top of the organization down. Sometimes with the aspirational candidate, it's coming from down the organization up where someone's going to their boss and saying, you know, I could really be better at, I, at what I am doing if I had some help in this area. And, you know, I think it's, it's good for us to recognize that there's, there's two different approaches here. You know, I, in a program that I worked with the author on, a fellow by the name of John Condre called 10 Cornerstones of Managing for High Performance, there's a test in there. I know everybody hears test and it's like, oh, gosh. And the test in maybe a dozen questions helps you figure out what your orientation is. Are you a problem solver or are you a goal achiever? And we might be able to set that up on our website. John, could we do that where people could download that test if they sure. wanted to? Sure. And then that way you kind of are creating a platform. Where am I stepping off from? I've been a problem solver and now what you're saying to me, Rick, is I have an opportunity to be a goal setter and a goal achiever and have that aspirational look. And what kinds of things might I need to read, readjust to be effective at that? So it's interesting. So as, as we look at coaching actions, and one of the great things about our podcasts is we, we go in a lot of different directions here. But when we look at that, that first step that we have to take, which is identifying the objective or the goal. I'm just going to share a quick story, and you guys have probably heard it from me before. One of the reasons I recognized the importance to this was I had a candidate that I was coaching not too long ago, and I kept asking the person what their goal was, and they kept telling me all of the actions that they wanted to take, but never would state the goal. And they felt they had to increase their presence on social media, and this was all under the guise of building a better business but we could never define what the better business was. And finally, after a lot of prodding, the individual indicated they wanted to grow their business by $250,000, and they wanted to increase their customer base by a certain number of customers per month. And finally, after extensive prodding, we finally identified the objective. We had gone round and round for hours, never really putting out a clear objective. So with that, once you have that objective in place, I think the second thing we have to do is create the plan. What, 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 do you, what do you put in place to make your coaching effective? So maybe we wind up using the SMART 
acronym that you guys mentioned last episode. And what was that that about? Was, I can't remember offhand. Yeah, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Gotcha. Which, by the way, sounds great. Uh, in, in my ins- uh, experience, you, you certainly uh, you can make it specific. That, that's fairly easy, and measurable is okay. Uh, attainable, that sometimes can be difficult, <laughs> mm-hmm. depending upon who's setting the goals. You know, uh, you get a boss you're working for and goes, you should be able to do this. You're sitting there going, uh, you know, they've lost their minds. I can't do that. That sort of, you know, puts a dent in this whole theory. Uh, again, attainable, realistic, somewhat the same, and time bound. So I, I think, uh, you know, both parties, uh, you really have to uh, try to agree on a number that's attainable because if, if, if it's getting shoved down your throat, uh, that's a whole process, I think, just that just falls apart because you give up before you even start. But I, I think using SMART, using it wisely, um, is, is a really great jumping off point for setting uh, goals and objectives. Now, without a doubt. And, you know, the other part of this is we call these any number of different things, action plans, tactical improvement plans. Great, we've got the objective, we've got the goal, but there has to be interim steps you take to achieve that. That's where your action plan, or again, whatever you want to call it, tactical improvement plan, comes in. There's got to be several steps. What steps do you have to take to reach the final goal? Well, PEIs um, can really be helpful. It's an acronym that stands for, we've got a lot of acronyms going around today. It's an acronym that stands for Personal Evaluation Interview. That sounds like a big deal. It's, it's not so much a big deal as it is an effective tool because it's a maybe a 10 to 20 minute conversation with your protege, the person that's being coached, and it's five simple questions. And the purpose is really for the person being coached. Managers think it's for them. It's not really for them. It's for the the protege or the person being coached. And the five simple questions are, what problems do you need my help to solve? Number two, what decisions do you need from me? Number three, what plans are you making that we haven't reviewed as yet? Number four, what's the status on things you're working on right now? And number five, and really not the least important, it's only less because the other four are so important. Business aside, how are you doing? Because lots of times in these kinds of situations, we lose sight of the personal concept, that context of there's stuff going on in their lives that can really affect their performance. And if you're coaching them, you need, you need to know that. So that's a PEI. I've used it with clients where Managers don't even ask the questions anymore. Bridgestone Golf was one client where the sales reps were so used to the five questions in a 20 minute hallway meeting that they would just spout out the answers. You know, um, I need you to make a decision on so and so. And what they're really saying to you is you're the bottleneck. So if we're, we're in a coaching situation, it's really important that you know where you're holding me back from getting where we agreed I wanted to get to. Or uh, you need to make a decision about X or Y, or um, I'm trying to make a plan here and I can't get your attention or your feedback. So it's really, it's simple. You can write it on a three by five card. The key to it is you gotta, you really have to schedule them. If you think a hallway meeting unscheduled it's going to work it probably won't everybody's busy but if you put it down and you just say on friday morning between nine and ten we need to connect for a pei so bill you're really talking about implementing a little structure you bet understanding and structure as a the next step after you've established the goal and created a plan and it's simple it really is so is this something that just runs as you need to, or is this set up like a any other kind of class where like every Monday we're going to need to talk about this, or every other week? Like, how does that usually plan out with the coach? I think you know flexibility obviously you know plays into this, but there has to be some structure, whether it's 
doesn't have to necessarily be every Monday, but there has to be a systematic follow-up. Remember, we, we've got a goal here. So when does the goal have to be completed? That's going to dictate quite a bit of, of how you structure something like this. But, you know, it's got to be systematic. It's got to be regular. It can't be something you visit every six months. There's, there's got to be a process here. Got it. I think, you know, just looking at the four of us sitting around a table, and if I'm working with manufacturers and they're on Kaizen and whatever, and they have gimba walks on Thursday morning at 730, people that are being coached need to build that kind of activity into their structure. And... Um, John, you you know what it's like when you have a call that has to happen on Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings, and you just have to be there. So I think that's where it can fall apart if you don't structure it well enough around the givens, the things you know are going to be blockers, if you will, and build them into your plan. Otherwise, you know, all of a sudden it's been two weeks and you never got together. You know, actually that brings us really to probably the next point, point number four here, in the process, which is the follow-up and analysis. You know, once once you've got the structure in place, you've got to follow it up systematically. You've got to understand where you are against the measurables. What are the measurables? You know, how do you know whether the protege or the candidate is progressing in the way that they, they want to go or you want them to go? Well, is that always taken care of by the coach? So say the person's, whether they're aspirational, they just want to get better, or they're on a PIP, probation, whatever, whatever you want to call it, regardless, is the coach calling the final shots with that? Or does the coach sometimes need to run it by that person's coworkers to see how they're doing? Like, where does that final measurable data come from? You know, it's a fluid process. You know, we often think, and, and usually is the case, that the, the coach, once the objective has been established and agreed upon, the coach kind of leads you know, the, the direction of the interaction. But that's not always the case. I mean, with, with any communication and we look at, you know, good leaders, whether they're in sports or otherwise, it's got to be an open lines of communication, you know. Yes, of course, the direction probably comes from the coach down to the candidate, but that doesn't mean that the interaction from the candidate up to the coach is not going to make the, pro the process more productive. Can you imagine a batting coach not getting feedback from the player. Well, I think we just witnessed that here in Philadelphia, which is why we got I mean, a new batting coach. Yeah, it's yeah. like if, if the idea is that the coach is going to say, well, drop your shoulder, do this, don't put it into your weight here, or whatever. That's It's really a one-sided disaster. I mean, if you're not finding out from the player, this is where I get stuck. This is the pitch that I struggle hitting. But I, I don't know how you'd be an effective batting coach if you're not listening. And I think, I, you know, to be able to to be open-minded and ask questions if you have to, I think a good protege is going to tell you where they get stuck. Don't you think, Rick? Uh, no, I, I agree with that. Yeah, if if, if you're, you're the coach and you find you're doing all the talking and you're setting out all the calls <laughs> and, and you're not getting any feedback, uh, I would suggest you're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all. I mean, you always have the final vote if you're trying to agree on some goals and the person you're trying to coach goes, "Well, I don't think that's reasonable." I mean, if you really think it's reasonable and attainable, you take time, explain to them why it is. Um, and, you know, not in all cases, if they don't achieve the goal, it doesn't mean they get fired. It just means you're trying to get them better. And if they're performing at, a, say, a C level and you're working with them to get them to a B and you get them to a C plus, well, that's better than a C. So it, it always, it's, got, it's not always going to be a threat. Again, it's for them. It's for their improvement. And not everybody's being coached. Um, if they're not successful, it doesn't mean they're not going to be working in that company anymore. Well, you know what? Let me throw a wrench into that. JT, I mean, you're a coach. Uh, and I, you know, Rick, you've had a, a tremendous amount of management experience. So for both of you, if you're doing the coaching, somebody's aspirational, or let's even say they're on a probation but not, I'm going to get fired probation. They're brought in and you're coaching them. And then you're finding out, yeah, they're getting better. Things are going well. But they're never going to be that person that the coaching is hoping for them to be. So what happens now? Is it something where you have to go back to that person's boss and say, well, you know what, Harry's doing great, but he's not going to be that person. And then what happens to Harry? Does he get his, his whole career path is sidelined all of a sudden because the management knows? Like, what's the ramifications of that? Well, 
I mean, depending upon you know where you're trying to get that. I mean, you know, they'll say we're going to do a review on the ideal team player. Uh, you're not going to have a team of uh, of employees that are all ideal team players. Mm -hmm. So the, the key would be to improve everybody. You know, so uh, if everybody's not going to be an A player, you're going to have a team that's going to have some B players. Probably going to have a team I, I think that might have a few C players. But if, if somebody's a D player mm -hmm. or lower, I, I think the, you at least got to get them to a C. Um, you know, if they're a C and you can't get them to a B, it may be okay, you know, because they sort of define their own growth from there. You know, if you're a C player, okay, well, you're going to be able to do what you're doing, but you're probably not going to be able to progress much further than that. Uh, that may be okay for the team, and it may be okay for the person. When well, think about Jack Welch's book where he was at the bottom 10% ought mm -hmm. to be turned over on a regular basis. I don't know if that has to be that severe. Yeah. But. And I think this is a, a future segment that we're, we're, we're kind of leading into here. And this actually gets into management. You know, I forget exactly who said it, but, you know, the sign of a good manager is putting people in the right places to succeed. But that being said, I think the next step we come to in the coaching process is with that open communication and seeing the progress and we're monitoring uh, and following up last step is going to be to, to find, refine or reset that coaching uh, situation. Is it accomplishing what you want? Does it need to be adjusted? Does it need to be reset completely? You know, this is the ongoing give and take in the process of coaching. Well, speed, I guess, is also part of that uh, determination. You know, are that is the progress going at the rate or the speed that originally was said or is it taking longer or is it moving faster so it's uh, comparing against the measurables and one of the measurables is you know how long did we think this was going to take and adjusting that you know it's interesting up to this point I think we've interspersed a lot of the uh, techniques if you will into uh, reviewing the different uh, actions that a coach takes. But let's take a second and talk about some of the coaching techniques. Uh, you know, we've talked about how does the how does the candidate, uh, what's their reaction going to be? Well, first and foremost, you better convey positive intent. You know, this is not a, a punishment or a punitive action. You know, it's a positive result or goal that we're looking to achieve. Yeah, and you can't just say, things are getting better. It's like, what does that mean? Or things aren't working out the way we hoped. It's like, you, you really need to be fact-based and somewhat specific. You know, that's not being fair to somebody. And you gotta listen. I mean, a, a little empathy goes a long way, you know? Yeah, I would agree. And, and I, I think it's part of that. They, they, you know, you need to state fairly clearly the impact of uh, their behavior. And, you know, if it's a situation where uh, if they don't hit certain goals, it's going to be a problem for them, uh, you're, you're much better off getting that out of the table. I mean, there's nothing worse. We all know people that have gotten fired working someplace, and you, you call them and go, what happens? And they, they go, I have no idea what happened. Uh, and if, if, if that's a situation, I mean, I, that's certainly bad for the person that doesn't have a job, and I would suggest it's bad for the company because people ought to understand, you know, what's expected of them, and if they can't do it, um, you know, business isn't always easy. Maybe they can't work there anymore. But um, it, it, I think it's grossly unfair just to, to fire somebody. And nobody wants to bleed their failing. So you really have to be specific about it. And sometimes those aren't easy conversations. But uh, again, you, you, they, they need to know the objective and they need to understand the impact of their behavior. Well, you know, one of the things a coach has to bring into this is really encouraging dialogue. And you know, to your point, Someone who comes out of this and they don't know what happened or why it happened. Right. Well, that there's obviously been a communication breakdown. Right. And the dialogue it goes two ways. You know, I, I don't know if you said it before, Rick, or whether it was uh, Bill or John. But if you're a coach and you're doing all of the communicating, all of the speaking, well, you're not doing a very good yeah. job. Yeah. I think one of the important parts is to focus on the solution when you're working with a person. And that's just people skills, to be honest with you. Um, you don't want to start, oh, by the way, we're going to get you coaching 
because you suck at this, you suck at this, you suck at this. <laughs> it's it's got to be, hey, we're doing coaching because you can be better at this. And we're going to get you better because we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We want you to be able to achieve X, Y, and Z. So, you know, it's, it's just like the asshole comment. I'm sorry about this. People are most comfortable with people just like them. And for you to sit down to coach someone with a hierarchical, I'm the boss and you're not, and here's what you got to do. Talk about perfume on a goat. That is never going to work. You, you really have to figure out. It's almost like, are we negotiating over a desk now that I want you to do this? And you're going to say, well, I don't know if I can do that, whatever. Or are we going to sit at a table, like we're at a table right now, and are we going to be like at 90 degrees where both of us can look at the same paper and give, whether it's an illusion or reality, but you give the impression that we're working on this together. This is not an adversarial deal. So, you know, I don't think we can forget that. Uh, that this is what is is their character like. And, you know, if they're not a, a, a real fact-based, disciplined person, the last thing you want to do is start lecturing them. And um, you can be listening, but if you're listening to reply, it doesn't really help establish that communication. I think that's where giving feedback yeah. is in, yeah, more in the process. Yeah. You know, and, and when you're giving feedback, there's probably a couple of things. There's probably some key questions that should come up throughout the process. First and foremost is, are we going in the right direction? You know, are we are are we actually taking the steps we need to reach that objective or the goal? Yeah. And does anybody care? Are we still <laughs> yeah. alive, alive here? Is everybody awake? So, I guess if you're giving the coaching, when you see those minor steps in the coaching process, if they're just not getting in or they need a little correction, you just need to herd the cats a little bit better, times yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, re remember the the idea of coaching is to help somebody improve. Uh, otherwise, why bother? Right. So if, if you're, if, as Bill was saying, if it's a one-way lecture from you and you're really not, you're just listening to answer, you're not going to accomplish anything. I mean, you, you really listen, need to listen to the person's feedback, understand what their issues are. Uh, and there's got to be a lot of positive uh, reinforcement along the way if you want to accomplish your goal. You know, it's interesting, too, because the effort seems to be to eliminate um, mistakes when, in fact, mistakes are what drives learning. I mean, you learn when you lose, <laughs> when you make a mistake. And uh, I think in this whole coaching enterprise, you have to give people enough rope, if you will, to let them try things and know that if it doesn't work out exactly right, they're not gonna get buried. They're not gonna get, it's not a lose. It's, you know, if you're learning a lesson that you can use moving forward, that's, a, that's what this is all about getting better. Mm -hmm. Well, for today, I think we've successfully gotten through the, the, the what's and, uh, and the how's of uh, coaching more effectively. So with that being said, for those that are listening right now, the show notes uh, up on the website will give you an opportunity to download a PDF and it's actually a checklist that will help you discover where your orientation is. Are you, are you more strongly oriented towards solving problems or are you more strongly oriented toward achieving goals? And then build some action steps into your own development and if, if you need to be more goal oriented. Um, don't forget the books you could be reading, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Ideal Team Player, both by Len Sioni, Seven Habits by Stephen Covey, uh, Kick Your Own Ass by Robert Early Johnson, and don't forget Will Durant saying, we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Um, till the next time, leave thoughts, questions, um, things that you would like us to do in the future. We're going to plan on doing a selection, promotion, and termination podcast to kind of explore a little bit more about how you decide when someone gets promoted and how you uh, best recruit them. And in some cases, we've 
talked about it a couple times here today. When is time to uh, cut bait, so to speak, and let somebody go? So with that being said, for the team, Bill Stats, Rick. Take care, Bill. Till next time, Bill. See you later. To learn more about the Summit Club podcast, please find us online at www.summitclubpodcast.com. The Summit Club podcast is recorded and produced by Inertia Marketing and Design, a full-service marketing, digital, and graphic communications agency. You can find them at www.inertia.marketing. Thanks for listening to the Summit Club podcast, and we'll see you at the top.